Well, I'm going to walk around just a little bit. Um, it's hard to believe that 72 hours ago, walk, walk near the lights. Walk near the lights. Walk near the lights. See, I got it wrong already. I actually fell off the stage already. So um, any of you who have never given your first talk and were worried that you'd be silly or make a fool of yourself or something, um, do not worry, because I've already done it for you. So 72 hours ago, people here, organizers, volunteers, were stuffing swag bags that you all got. It is hard to believe that we are almost at the end of the 10th PyCon Argentina. And I have to say, I am so, so happy that I have had the time to spend the last few days with you. Um, many of you have inspired me. And sometimes we wonder, like, hey, are we making any impact? And then you see what amazing things people are doing with Python. And it's much beyond the code. It's also the community. Um, I was a little nervous speaking because actually Brandon is one of my heroes in Python um, because he does an amazing job teaching other people and also giving to the community. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share a little bit about what I learned from Guido and um, something he shared with all of us a couple of years ago. And it's a lesson that I think is really powerful for all of us. All right. And if I can get my clicker to work without falling off the stage, we're all going to have a better time. There. Ah. OK. So hello, PyCon Argentina again. Sharing the past few days with all of you has been absolutely amazing. And I want to give a big thank you to the organizers, the sponsors, the volunteers, the speakers, particularly the first time speakers. Yay! And of course, all of you, the attendees. You are what makes this conference great. And it's going to be really exciting to see what you do beyond this 10th PyCon, what you're going to do in the 11th. Um, and um, driving from the airport the other day on Wednesday, we had a lovely conversation. During the drive, we discussed how much the Python community had changed in the past five years. In my own home, San Diego, I've actually only been part of Python for five years. And I've seen tremendous things, which is really exciting. And to think that PyCon Argentina, how it's grown over the last 10 years, is really amazing. So today, I want to share two communities which has helped us thrive, and myself in particular, the Jupyter community and the Python community. But first, I want to share take a moment to share with you some wisdom from Guido Van Rossum, who's the creator of Python. Guido's lesson about sharing the future was formed years ago in his entertaining King's Day speech, which is actually on his website. Um, two years ago, he started a talk about um, talking about Python and its growth. During this talk, he said the most important lesson that he learned when he was a child and a student was that sharing makes a huge difference. And in 1999, when he outlined his goals for the Python language, he wanted it to be an easy and intuitive language, just as powerful as major competitors. It should be open source so anyone can contribute to its development. Its code should be understandable. Because of course, if you're going to go to the trouble of making a language, you want people to use it. And it should be suitable for everyday tasks, allowing people to get real work done in short development times. Um, since 2013, I've seen how sharing Python at my local meetup group in San Diego has changed the lives of other people. I've seen complete beginners four years ago 
return to PyCon US this past year and actually give a three hour tutorial teaching intro to Python to other new developers. And that is really rewarding to see. I've also seen in the last five years huge growth in both Jupyter and Python and their impact on people around the world. Today I want to share a look at some of the things that are going on in Jupyter and in Python, their present state, a little bit about their community, and some of the possibilities for the future. After that, I want to encourage you to be a part of their future. So without further ado, let's get started with Jupyter and where we are today. Project Jupyter is a nonprofit open source project that builds open source tools used in computational thinking and analysis. And that's a lot of words. But in essence, what it is, is it makes it easier for you to get work done and to share the work that you've done with others so that they can benefit from the work. So I want to take a quick look at some of the projects that are currently being worked on in Jupyter. <clears throat> Um, Jupyter's success is due to people using the notebooks. How many people have seen a Jupyter notebook? Hopefully most of you by the end of the conference because A, there's going to be some in here and also we had a great talk earlier today that was an intro to Jupyter and I saw a bunch of data science machine learning talks over the last few days so thank you for sharing Jupyter with many people. Um, the Jupyter Notebook has made, the Python, has made Python's rich ecosystem of libraries more accessible. There are many tasks with these libraries that can be accomplished in five lines of code or less. Brandon talked yesterday about activation energy and how we can get things done quicker and more efficiently. And one of the notebook strengths is that exactly that. It lets us use interactive code, prose, and visualizations to tell a computational story. This past year, Adam Rule at UCSD, so just down the street from me, analyzed one million notebooks on GitHub. What he found is that most notebooks were structured in a similar way. Narrative text or prose describing the notebook and code and visualizations provide the user a way to interact with the data. His research also included ways to improve the notebooks going forward. This interactive creation of notebooks has made many fields more accessible to people. We've seen a boom of people using the notebooks in science, education, data science, journalism, and many more fields. Now, if you ever want to get a sense of what is currently popular and trending, you can visit GitHub's trending notebook page and see what is trending these days. Right now, there's a lot of machine learning, but there's also some good tutorials up there as well. Beyond Python, um, the notebooks are actually built using Python and JavaScript. Um, but beyond Python, the notebooks support many different programming languages. While Python is by far the most popular language used in the notebooks, there are many other languages being used now. Definitely over 50 languages at this point have support within the notebooks. And it's the community that, other than the Python kernel, it's the community that makes all these other language kernels possible the R kernel, Julia, Go, Rust, um, processing, man, many others. The classic notebook <clears throat> provides more functionality than just notebook creation. It includes a file browser, a text editor, and a terminal too. Yet some professional data scientists and researchers wanted even more power and functionality than what the classic notebook offered. Recognizing the need to serve power data science users as well as those new to programming, the Jupyter team knew that different user interfaces would be needed to meet users' different needs. Several years ago, the team began work on Jupyter Lab 
And Jupyter Lab is the next generation web-based extensible user interface for Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter Lab <clears throat> provides a multi-window experience, much like an IDE. Unlike traditional IDEs, though, Jupyter Lab offers an integrated experience for investigating data and interacting with your data. You're able to pull up related notebooks, try what-if scenarios, and add interactivity using widgets. And the widgets actually make it really cool because you can demonstrate to people how things change and what the reaction is. And you can do it through a visualization, which is very powerful. Um, to serve groups of users, uh, several of us started putting together what we call Jupyter Hub. Um, and Jupyter Hub is near and dear to my heart. It gives a group of users a Jupyter Notebook server for each person. And it eliminates the need for users to have to install any software other than a web browser on their own computer. So it's particularly useful in teaching where students, such as what Anna had just said before, maybe the students have only cell phones or tablets and, or laptops, or maybe you're in a university class and somebody has the best laptop in the world and somebody has one that maybe is six years old. As long as it can run a web browser, they are both gonna get the same experience using JupyterHub. Um, I know some folks had talked to me about Kubernetes over the last few days, and um, Kubernetes, um, for those of you that haven't used it, it is a new trend in DevOps for doing operations at scale. And for JupyterHub, we created a zero to JupyterHub guide that walks you through a step-by-step -step installation and configuration process for JupyterHub on Kubernetes. In fact, Google used our directions to tell people how to build Kubernetes on their Google Cloud. So um, we spent a lot of time working with our users as Kubernetes was evolving to make sure that you could have a good experience installing Jupyter Hub using Kubernetes. Kubernetes lets us do easier administration, more scaling, better monitoring, and overall just makes the um, cluster that is running Jupyter Hub much more stable. Now, I'm really pleased to see this is not even a year old. It, we introduced it earlier this year. Binder is a free service that allows users to enter a Git repo into the user interface and then press a little, I guess it's orange or yellow, launch button. And what happens is you're, the cloud actually builds you a temporary Docker container where it installs all the dependencies for you to run the notebooks or other things other than the notebooks in that container. And um, it's there for you to use until you close your browser and then we will exit it. Um, but you can save it. Um, what we did is we re-architected Binder, which Jeremy Freeman had had a proof of concept on, to use the Jupyter Hub and Kubernetes as its foundation. Um, currently, we launch between 70 and 80,000 binders per week. And we recently passed our 2 million launch mark since we reintroduced um, mybinder.org this year. So, People really like it. Um, it's, it's been really fun for us to see. Uh, let's see if we can, I'm not gonna do a live demo because the internet was not cooperating earlier. But basically, you type in your GitHub URL or just the uh, repo name, hit launch, and then if you can see on the bottom, it's hard to see, it'll say waiting as it starts thinking about what to build. Then it will go into a, a building the Docker container. And then over time, what it will do 
is it will continue to install stuff and you can pull up the build log so you can actually track what's going on while it's building. The first time it builds, it takes a while. It takes a while to build a Docker container and then push it to a um, repository for Docker containers. But the second time you run it, or the second time someone else runs that repo, it actually launches much quicker. And this is still installing, so we're not gonna wait for all of it. But once it does load, it loads a file browser, in this case it loads Jupyter Lab, and you have a notebook here, and that notebook can be executed. So each cell can be executed. And remember, this is all over the internet. You haven't had to install anything locally. And it will create visualizations. It will let you manipulate them with widgets. There's a little bit of latency because of the Wi-Fi that we had before. But it lets you see, as you change those variables, what happens with those Lorenz um, curves. So moving beyond just the projects to the people of Jupyter, um, Jupyter's success is due to the people building and using the notebooks. There's millions of users out there with data scientists, students, and research scientists being the biggest users. Now you would think all of these amazing tools would take millions of people, thousands of people to build. This is actually our small core team of people spread throughout the world. Some of us are full-time on Jupyter, but a lot of us are not. We have other jobs as well. And these developers create the core projects within Jupyter with a lot of help from many contributors like yourself around the world. We could not do what we do without the community's input. And um, one of the nice things is by having input from the community, we're able to grow, change, and evolve based on what you, the user, needs. Um, earlier this year, we were awarded a significant honor, the ACM Software System Award, this award is given to an institution or individuals recognized for developing a software system that has had a lasting influence, reflected in contributions to concepts and commercial acceptance or both. Prior winners of this award includes Unix, the World Wide Web, the Mosaic Browser, Java, and TCP IP. Now, Argentina was well represented at this award ceremony. Um, Damian, you want to stand up and wave hi? Um, Damian Avila, who's in from Cordova, was recognized <laughs> along with 14 others. Um, and he's been a wonderful ambassador for the Jupiter Project, for including community within the project, and um, you guys are well represented, and um, if you get a chance to introduce yourself to Damian, I highly encourage it, because he's a really wonderful person. Um, lifelong learning is becoming more and more important, and teachers and students, whether it's adult teachers and adult students, or students, middle school kids teaching each other, is really important. Like the Django Girls event on Thursday, teachers and students working together open doors and welcome new members into our community. If you were at the Django Girls event earlier this week, please give yourself a big hand because the mentors, the students, all did a fantastic job. And I hope you will share what you learn with others as well. So the possibilities for Jupiter are vast. I think we've barely scratched the surface, particularly in education, of what can be done with Jupiter and the tools in the ecosystem. In 2014, Lorena Barba, who's an aeronautical engineering professor at George Washington, and um, I believe she's originally from Chile, uh, 
she gave an enthusiastic keynote at SciPy about how notebooks were connecting her students to learning. She said, IPython notebooks, which is what it was called before Jupyter notebooks, are a killer app. I wholeheartedly agreed with her then, and we both wished that they would go viral, and indeed they did. In 2013, she actually brought a set of 12 notebooks here to Argentina to teach a two-day workshop on computational fluid dynamics, and the Navier-Stokes equations are quite complex. If you teach it in a traditional university setting, it typically takes four to five weeks to get through that material. But what she found when she was here in Argentina is she could get the same level of learning done in two full days using the set of notebooks and having the learners explore the notebooks and retype the notebooks and really make notes. And that's a phenomenal. From four to five weeks to two days is huge. So it really does um, shorten the learning curve on things. Uh, Jason Moore, who is a professor at UC Davis, he's rewritten, um, along with Kenneth Lyons, a traditional mechanical engineering textbook. And for each chapter, which roughly corresponds to a lecture, They've developed these rich visualizations that, with the widgets, allow students to see how things work, like frictions or springs. And you know, I think in this particular example, they could put different weights into the little cart and see how it changes the speed and the movement. Um, Jason also has put together a particularly favorite workshop of mine that uses SymPy, PyDi, which is a dynamics library, and widgets to create a set of eight notebooks that illustrate the physics and the math of a human body trying to balance while standing. And as you go through notebook after notebook, you are ultimately rewarded with an animated visualization of a body. Um, much more detailed than this picture here, of the body trying to balance where you can control different variables that affect the balance, whether it's the leg length, um, you know, the length of the torso, the center of gravity, or the center of mass. Um, very, very cool. Uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist, Thomas Sargent and his team, have developed a comprehensive graduate economics class, and they're now working on an undergraduate economics class using the notebooks. And I highlight this both because it is a good um, use of the notebooks, but also because this particular curriculum, Quant Econ, has notebooks in both Python and Julia. And Julia is a newer language, but is often used more and more in bioinformatics and data science um, and financial modeling. And its syntax is very similar to Python, but it has some performance that is more uh, faster in certain things than Python is with the GIL. So it is well worth checking out if you need performance, um, because the two do interact well together. Um, the notebook's elegant simplicity was what encouraged me five years ago to learn more. Um, what I found was there were no artificial barriers to getting started. I found a music theory library called Music 21, and I started playing around with the notebooks, and I found I could do a lot of things with two lines of code, five lines of code, and as I was doing these experiments in my local hacker space, what I noticed were students that normally were not interested in anything to do with computers were actually interested in the notebooks because music resonated with them. There was something about music that lowered the barrier of entry. And 
what they could do is not just visualize the music with the sheet music rendering, but you could also play the music. So it was really engaging and it would pull in students. They could also do some composing and um, also they could take the sheet music and translate it into braille. So it really did some powerful things that people could see how it could be used in the real world, their world. Um, back to Damien, sharing with others is a key future goal of the notebooks. And Damien has developed a project called RISE. And RISE helps um, people present using the notebooks. And what's really great is if you are teaching with this, you can actually go in and edit the slides in real time and see the, how it changes on screen. So you can tailor a lesson as a student asks a question. So um, Damien, if you have an interest in that, he's around. So um, I do say try it out and ask him if you have questions. And then as publishing and sharing notebooks are important uses for the future, we're seeing Django being used to serve the notebooks in many different circumstances. We're also seeing things like the LIGO project and uh, the black holes colliding, um, enabling reproducible science. We're seeing more and more uses of open data journalism where it's critical. And this is critical because as more data is collected about us, and is used by machine learning for predictions and decision making, journalism will be more and more important with the data that is collected about us. So to wrap up the Jupiter section of this talk, we've learned some valuable lessons about open source, the power of an interactive web, and how to make things be at global scale. And after I take a sip of water, I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about Python. And I'll try not to fall off the stage. We're still good on time, right? Okay. Okay. All right. So Python and its community create even more possibilities for the future. That's why we're here, right? And one thing we know about Python is change is constant. Whether it's the language evolving or our BDFL Guido retiring as BDFL and stepping down for the future, Python will continue to evolve with the changes it faces just as it has done from its start 30 years ago. As these changes are happening, however, People have opinions, and it's important to remember, especially during times of change, that we need to work together to understand opinions as opposed to just dismissing them right away. And I want to take a look at, um, for a moment, at the changes that Python is facing now as a language. So Python's come a long way since 1989. We have a rich ecosystem of libraries, and in particular, we now have a nice new interface for PyPI, which distributes um, the different libraries and packages. It has grown tremendously. There are over 150,000 projects on PyPI, with more than one million releases, and you know the numbers grow very quickly. A month ago, I think we were at 140 something thousand projects. So um, a lot of projects done in one month. Um, and I think the Python packaging team deserves a huge thank you, particularly Donald Stuffed, for helping us receive our favorite projects quickly and reliably. It wasn't that long ago that it was hard to install Python packages, and it is much better now. Um, so if you do see them in your travels or online, I would encourage you to thank them. Um, huge progress has also been made. Um, we had a nice lightning talk about how Python 2 sucks or legacy Python sucks, 
and Python 3 is the way of the future. It's often been said that it's hard to migrate to Python 3 because your packages don't work on Python 3. Well, I am very, very pleased to announce that as of this month, we are now 359 of the 360 most popular projects now support Python 3. And it is more possible than ever to migrate legacy code on Python 2 to Python 3 as Instagram, Dropbox, and others have shared with us at different conferences. We're a little over a year away from Python 2.7's retirement. Um, and we will see what happens with that. I, I, in some way, there's legacy code out there. And if you don't have a business case to migrate the legacy code, you may choose not to. It's not that 2.7 is going away. It's just no longer going to be actively developed. If you have not tried Python 3 and you're getting ready to start a new project, I highly encourage you to do so. The security is better. The user developer experience is better. And um, it is what people, particularly in the sciences and data sciences, have embraced and are continuing to go forward with. So now that Guido has retired as BDFL, we're at a crossroads in Python's history. There's still a lot of opportunities out there, but some clarity needs to emerge about what happens to the development of Python now that Guido is not there to decide on PEPs and the direction of the language. Um, back in September, a lot of the core developers got together at Microsoft and spent a week with Guido and others. And we spent a lot of time coding, but we probably spent more time talking about governance and how we were going to manage projects and people and the possibilities for the future. And I don't expect you to read all of these, but what we started doing at that core sprint was coming up with ideas for what the future governance of CPython might include. Some common themes emerged from the sprint, such as the importance of language stewardship, the ongoing quality and health of the language, and undertaking new projects to evolve with our users' needs. Through a lot of hard work and the most respectful discussions I have seen within the core Python community, we have a number of PEPs under further review and in the beginning of December, we're going to start a governance selection process vote um, to try and come up with what we feel will serve Python the best going forward. Now, there are, I think, six different proposals on the table for different governance structures. I am very confident that whichever one is chosen that Python will continue to thrive and succeed under any of those governance structures. And a lot of the underlying things are very similar across them, but why am I so confident and optimistic about the future of Python under any of those structures? Well, it's due to the people in the Python community. And here are some attendees from the first PyCascades conference earlier this year. We learn from each other and we benefit from each other's experience. 10 years ago, PyCon Argentina was the new conference. Now you're a model for starting conferences and you should really congratulate yourselves on how far you have grown your community. And um, I'm looking at some lovely organizers off stage. So um, thank you all for doing that and for sharing your knowledge with others. Python's uses span many industries and fields. This versatility gives strength to the language and its ability to get things done for users. As we look at Python's development governance in the future, one thing is clear. The future must reflect our users around the globe and it must take into consideration 
a diversity of ideas, not just in projects or industries served, but in the people we serve. So how do we include a diversity of ideas? Well, just like code, we use sensible defaults. I've been very pleased by the respect that's been shown since Guido announced his retirement from, as BDFL. And as we listen to each other, really listen to understand, consider what you are hearing from someone else, and value the ideas of others, and try and improve communication between you, you yourselves. This ultimately will lead us to better solutions. Sharing, Guido's most important lesson, helps us build knowledge and understand each other's different experiences. We trust that others are capable too. When negativity creeps into online discussions, it's an anti-pattern for creativity and innovation. So let's keep the discussions on the issues and try and avoid silencing others. There's a lot to know as a developer. Too much for anyone to know it all. It's humility that helps us learn from our temporary failures and to work with others to create innovation and long-term success. Yesterday's diversity discussion gave us an opportunity to share ideas and listen to each other with respect. Improvement and change is always possible, and with effort, it comes sooner than you think. So looking forward to innovation and growth, what are some possibilities for Python in the future? With the growth of JavaScript, the ability to manipulate the DOM to provide rich user experiences is becoming the user's expectation. We're seeing more emphasis on interactivity, such as in the Jupyter Notebooks, in education, in research, and in explorations in data science. Sphinx documentation in Python is getting more interactive too. For example, the IPy Volume project is a 3D modeling library. Its Sphinx documentation enables interactive manipulation of objects and widgets. And this is within Read the Docs. And you can move things around, you can explore right within the documentation. And that's pretty powerful because oftentimes you're going to have to go and load it on your system and then try it out. Well, here you get the opportunity to try it in line. Um, looking towards the future, WebAssembly appears to be an important technology for the web. While Python has traditionally had weaker offerings for mobile gaming and distribution of binaries, that's beginning to change with projects like Beware. And I'm hopeful that more projects will continue to create interesting tools and applications in these spaces. Productivity is already a strength of Python. With the growth of the notebooks and greater adoption of Python 3, people's productivity will continue to increase. Great work on async IO is enabling multiple actions to take place at once and provide greater efficiency in web applications. We'll continue to see more and more specialized libraries for different uses, and libraries like MicroPython and CircuitPython are pushing Python into the embedded world, changing the programming of robots, sensors, and electronics. One of Python's growing areas is its global usage. We're seeing more effort and growth in every continent. Pi Argentina is one of the leaders in South American Python growth. This conference's talk schedule really showed the depth and breadth of Python's usage in Argentina and the outreach and education that you are doing will empower even more Python users. The Django Girls event on Thursday introduced Python, Git, and Django to another 70 or so women. 
There was great energy and enthusiasm at the event, and I'm so happy that some of the groundwork we laid several years ago to provide grants when I was a PSF director has made its way into these events that are having a profound impact around the globe. The PSF, or Python Software Foundation, is the nonprofit organization whose goal is to improve and advance the use of Python across the world. There are now five staff members who run the operations of the organizations. There's also many more volunteers from the community who work with the PSF to run conferences like PyCon US, local meetup groups, grants for special events like Django Girls, infrastructure for PyPI so we can continue getting the packages that we like to use. And I want to spend a second showing you how easy it is to join the PSF as a free member and to show your support for Python. And basically, you go to python.org, looks like this. Some of you might have used it to download Python or documentation. <clears throat> Hang on. Okay. So what happens is you go to the PSF tab, and there's a membership link. And somewhere in that list is sign up as a member. You create an account, and you're done. Um, you may have to verify your email once you do the account, but it is really that straightforward. So I want to wrap up spending a little time talking about PyCon Argentina. Again, congratulations for making it to your 10-year anniversary. It has been tremendous to see the use of Python and Jupyter at this conference. The people here have been incredibly kind and helpful to me and to each other. I am really humbled by the work that is going on in education. We saw Anna and her students. That is the future, and the support that you're giving them is, is wonderful. There's been a lot of knowledge and ideas shared here, which will create even more possibilities for your projects and creations. PyCon Argentina definitely captures the spirit of Guido's idea that a programming language creating by a, created by a community fosters happiness in its users. And I think we definitely saw that at lunch today. Um, we had a lot of fun talking about code, and really good food. It was the first time I had had meat in Argentina, so um, thank you for taking me to lunch um, and sharing your Python thoughts. And, and I want to encourage all of you to submit a talk proposal next year to PyCon Argentina or to PyCon US if you've already spoken before, or a poster. And as we look at 2019 and beyond, the future of Python really depends on you. By embracing the possibilities that Jupyter and Python offer, we have the power to create value, connect people, and most importantly, improve the world that we share. It's my hope that when you return home, that you will continue sharing what you have learned during this conference with others. I can't wait to see what PyCon Argentina looks like next year. So thank you. Happy creating and sharing. That's all I have. And a huge thank you for the translation that is happening behind the scenes. Um, I could not have done this talk without that. Caro nos dijo que iba a estar feliz de responder una pregunta, así que si alguien tiene una pregunta, acérquese acá al micrófono, así la hace. Nosotros, si la quieren hacer en español, se la traducimos y ella va a responder. ¿Alguno? 
¿no? Bueno, un fuerte aplauso para ella. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you all. It has truly been a pleasure.